Washington, October the 22nd, 1962. The American president, John F. Kennedy, delivers a chilling address to his country and to the world. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. For seven terrifying days, the island of Cuba became the focal point of the gravest international crisis since the Second World War. Cuba's leader, Fidel Castro, and the Russians were installing nuclear missiles on the island. The Americans wanted those missiles off Cuba. For many people, the resulting confrontation led to the worst week of their lives. Oh, it was an appalling shock. Uh, it brought the possibility of nuclear holocaust very close at hand. It was, I would guess, the moment of greatest tension in the Cold War. It's the only occasion on which I know where nuclear war was a real possibility or was even entertained as an option by either side. For a week, the world held its breath as the two leaders, Khrushchev and Kennedy, headed towards a confrontation that seemed likely to end in nuclear catastrophe. In 1958, a revolution led by Fidel Castro overthrew the old corrupt regime of the Cuban dictator, General Batista. At first, America welcomed this revolution, but by 1962, the mood had changed. Castro had introduced sweeping social and economic reforms. He nationalized the sugar plantations and the large industrial firms. In particular, he attacked American interests in Cuba, as this 1961 film revealed. Most Americans detest him. They have their reasons. Castro confiscated their property. He nationalized their oil refineries. Castro nationalized the American department stores in Havana, and the hotels, and the casinos. He even nationalized Coca-Cola. America retaliated with a trade embargo on Cuban goods. Castro was forced to turn to Russia and to the communist world for survival. Today, new lorries in Havana are not from Detroit, but from Moscow. Tin food is not from Chicago, but from Warsaw, Leningrad, and Peking. Today's foreign hero is not Elvis Presley, but Yuri Gagarin. So within three years, Castro changed Cuba from being a friend of the United States into a thorn in the side of America. Some people call Cuba a communist state, others a Marxist state. Castro calls it a socialist republic. No matter what word you use, the island of Cuba which is much the same size as Britain, is today an outpost, the only acknowledged outpost of the communist world in the Western Hemisphere. It's very hard now to appreciate the ferocity of American feeling. And there was a great fear that Castro not only uh, was appropriating American assets and so on in, in Cuba, uh, but was going to uh, trigger revolutions all, all over the place and put enormous pressure on the United States, as well as possibly turning into a base for, for wider Soviet operations. Here was a communist state 90 miles offshore. Uh, and it was in that area that Americans have always been most sensitive about because the quickest way to get anything from the east coast of America to the west, anything that is particularly heavy, is to put it in a ship and float it and take it through the Panama Canal. And if you're going to defend the coast of America, then you've got to be able to put the Navy back and forth between it. And the result is that anything in the Caribbean touches as tender a point uh, for America as having the Germans in Calais or, or Antwerp would for Britain, or did for Britain. The Americans decided to act. 
1961, they armed and trained a force of 1,500 Cuban exiles and landed them here in the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. It was hoped that the Cuban people would support them and Castro would be overthrown. But it was a total disaster, as this Cuban supporter of Castro described. Some of them didn't even get ashore. Our flyers bombed their ships. And for those who did get to the beach, well, the militia boys were soon there to meet them. The fighting lasted three days. The militia captured about 1,200 of them. When it was over, about 80 people lay dead. And a couple of hundred mercenarios must have drowned in the bay as well. Castro had won this time, but he believed that the Americans might try again. Not surprisingly, he turned to President Khrushchev for military help. And initially, Khrushchev's reaction to what had happened in Cuba, the Fidel Castro revolution, was a bit ambivalent because he wasn't sure that this man was actually a communist or that he was proceeding on the right lines. But partly he began to sense that uh, something was happening in Cuba that was important, that was near enough communist to be worth supporting, and of course it was taking place in a crucial part of the world, near the United States. Khrushchev came to Castro's aid with Russian military equipment and personnel, but that wasn't all. He then took the decision to place nuclear missiles in Cuba. Well, Khrushchev said in his memoirs, and there's been other corroborative evidence for this, uh, that he was motivated by the defense of Cuba, that he was worried that there would be another uh, invasion from the United States, but this time somewhat more competent than the, the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and this could only be uh, prevented by serious Soviet support, and that he had the idea of bringing the missiles in gradually, announcing them as a fait accompli, uh, and providing a real deterrent. Another thing was the, the whole contest with the United States. Partly this was uh, one that had been bred into the two countries at the end of the Second World War during the Cold War. Partly it was something that was personal, personal between Khrushchev and Kennedy. And uh, I think that whatever happened, uh, Khrushchev didn't want to come off second best. So if there was a, an issue in terms of missiles, an issue in terms of disarmament, rearmament, whatever it was, Khrushchev was going to come off best. Here suddenly was an opportunity presented by the island of Cuba, perhaps to win something in the race with the United States. Khrushchev d did believe in, in, in bluff. I mean, he, it was part of his general uh, approach. And he clearly thought that he, that, that he could slip these missiles in uh, over a period of time. And then once they were all constructed, there was nothing that the Americans could do about it. And he got away with it for some time before the Americans discovered it. But on October the 14th, the Americans did discover what Khrushchev and Castro had been up to. American planes brought back the first pictures of the missile sites on the island. This is how the Americans reported the discovery. The evidence is incontrovertible. Aerial cameras in American military reconnaissance planes made remarkable photographs, such as this one of a medium-range ballistic missile base, which documents the Soviet offensive buildup in Cuba. The Defense Department says there are eight to 10 missile bases in Cuba. This photograph shows a surface-to-air missile assembly depot. What action could President Kennedy take? American intelligence reported that the medium-range missiles could strike 1,000 miles away, long-range missiles 2,000 miles. 80 million Americans were under threat. At the White House, Kennedy's advisers drew up a list of options. The first was to do nothing, ignore the missiles in Cuba. This was not in his nature. It was not the kind of image which he'd campaigned on. And most of all, he had already tangled with Khrushchev the previous summer in Vienna after, in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs. And Khrushchev appeared to have formed the opinion that Kennedy was a pushover. It was therefore not doing anything would be, would be been taken as, or so it appeared to the Americans, would have been taken as a, as a direct signal to Khrushchev that he could do the same in a lot of other places, including Berlin. There was a suggestion of a purely political solution, uh, just trying to handle it by diplomacy. But really, that didn't get 
much uh, credibility simply because there wasn't seem to be any reason why Khrushchev would need to back down in, if there was no uh, stick behind American diplomacy. A third option was to use the stick, an airstrike on the missile sites followed possibly by an invasion of Cuba. This option was favoured by Kennedy's military advisers. The reason why they didn't go for it in the end was um, first because the military presented it as a very big airstrike. There didn't seem to be a limited option, so lots of people would have been killed. And the, the, there was a fearfulness about uh, a military response uh, from the Soviet Union, but as much a, a fear of the political reaction that this would seem to be a, a pretty appalling thing for the Americans to be doing, and this idea of, of a Pearl Harbor in reverse, uh, which Robert Kennedy promoted within the decision-making uh, process, was. Um, was very influential, that it was just simply would be immoral to do that. After days of agonised debate, President Kennedy went for a fourth option. This is how the Daily Mirror reported it. US moves on Cuba. Now it's the big blockade. On Monday, October the 22nd, President Kennedy went on television to announce his decision. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. An arc was drawn 500 miles around Cuba and ringed by American warships. Any ship inside the arc and bound for Cuba would be stopped and inspected. President Kennedy signed the blockade order, which came into effect on Wednesday, October the 22nd. Defence Secretary Robert McNamara spelt out the warning to Russia. The forces under my command, that is to say under the command of the President, are ordered to interdict, subject to certain instructions contained in the proclamation, the delivery of offensive weapons and associated material to Cuba. Those are the instructions we've been given, those are the instructions we will carry out. It was estimated that 25 ships were on the way to Cuba. What action would Khrushchev take if a Russian ship was stopped or boarded or was fired on? The Russians decided to ignore the blockade. They called it an act of piracy, an aggressive action which cynically flouted international standards. Their ships held their course for Cuba as the Daily Mail reported. Ready to board, 1 a.m. warning as 25 Russian ships stay on collision course. Elsewhere, too, tension increased as the American military machine went into action. Bombers armed with nuclear weapons flew patrols. It was revealed later that the United States had mobilized more than 300,000 troops in the southeast of the country. Fear grew, especially in Cuba, as this Pathé report revealed. Now dramatically from Havana come films taken on the eve of the crisis. A tenseness was unmistakable. Both people and government expected an American invasion. Students helped to man the anti-aircraft guns. Not very impressive looking weapons against the sort of planes the US could have sent over if invasion had been the plan. At last the Cubans, army and people, knew that Russian rocket sites had been installed and that more were on the way before President Kennedy imposed the blockade. Needless to say, it was still easy to fan anti-American feeling, playing on the supposed threat of invasion. On Thursday, October the 25th, the crisis switched to the United Nations. The American ambassador, Adelaide Stevenson, confronted the Russian ambassador. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? You will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. Kennedy's blockade was backed by his allies, including Britain. But not everyone was convinced that America was in the right. There were mass demonstrations in London calling for hands off Cuba. 
Back at sea, the first confrontations began. On Thursday, October 25th, the Navy intercepts the Soviet tanker Bucharest and allows her to proceed. On Friday, another encounter takes place at sea. A Soviet chartered vessel, the Marukla, is stopped, boarded and inspected, then cleared to proceed to Cuba. At the same time, a new set of spy photographs revealed that the crisis showed no signs of slowing down. Low-level reconnaissance planes at near treetop level surprise the Cuban anti-aircraft crews, catch them running for their guns, and report that work on the missile sites is still going forward at a feverish pace around the clock. This Daily Mirror cartoon summed up the crisis. Khrushchev and Kennedy have a choice of two lifts. One is marked summit talks, the other leads to nuclear hell. Which lift will they take? On the fifth day of the crisis, the first signs of a breakthrough. The Daily Mirror reported. Red ships altering course away from Cuba. Kay says, I'm prepared to talk to Kennedy. What made Khrushchev change his mind? Well, I think he was certainly shocked that the United States took an action which he couldn't deal with because he was sensible enough as a hard-working politician who had been through a lot to realise that the other side had all the weapons that he didn't have. And he accepted, he understood clearly that he couldn't break the blockade. And also he was surprised at the speed of the reaction. I don't think he understood that uh, Kennedy, when he wanted to be decisive, could be decisive. On Friday, October the 26th, Khrushchev and Kennedy began to negotiate with an exchange of letters. First, Khrushchev wrote, This is my proposal. No more weapons to Cuba and those within Cuba withdrawn or destroyed. You reciprocate by withdrawing your blockade and also by agreeing not to invade Cuba. But on the next day, Saturday, Khrushchev sent a second letter. This one took a much harder line. We agree to move these weapons from Cuba, which you regard as offensive weapons. Your representative will make a statement to the effect that the United States, on its part, will evacuate its analogous weapons from Turkey. How would Kennedy react? Kennedy's brother Robert came up with the answer. He said they should ignore the second letter and reply only to the first. The president agreed. John F. Kennedy then wrote to Khrushchev saying that if the missiles were removed from Cuba, he would... Remove promptly the quarantine measures now in effect and give assurances against an invasion of Cuba. On Sunday, October the 28th, Khrushchev accepted the deal. The Soviet government has given a new order to dismantle the arms which you describe as offensive and to create them and return them to the Soviet Union. The Cuban Missile Crisis was over, as Pathé News jubilantly reported. The man who talked to the Russians plainly, firmly, and meant every word he said, is the hero of America, and is fervently thanked by the great majority of the Western world. Kennedy was regarded as the hero of the hour, but Russia too claimed it had achieved a victory. Khrushchev maintained uh, that he'd got what he wanted out of the crisis, which is a, a firm pledge from Kennedy not to attack Cuba. I don't think Kennedy had any intention at that point of attacking Cuba, but it was not incredible, given what had happened in the past, that he might. The crisis had ended peacefully, but it had been one of the longest weeks in politics and one of the most dangerous. And there's a very moving account in Robert Kennedy's memoir uh, of the crisis, of, of the sheer anxiety that, that he and his brother then faced. Uh, as the Soviet ships moved towards uh, the blockade line. What was the phrase? Dean Rusk, the American Secretary of State, said, we were eyeball to eyeball with them and I think the other side blinked. Suddenly to find a crisis where a war might start, nuclear weapons be used, it was frightening. 